very much, everyone, and good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I wasn't so sure who was going to come. I only knew that I had been asked to uh, come and give a talk, and I wasn't quite sure who the audience uh, was going to be. Uh, so, maybe before I start, I will say a little bit about myself. I think my profile was sent out, but I am a um, nutritionist actually by training and, and a public health specialist, I would say, in the last few years. And I've been doing quality improvement um, with URC actually for the last nine years on different uh, topic areas. I started off with nutrition, which was integrating nutrition into uh, care for people living uh, with HIV and then went on to the continuum of response for HIV work and then on to PMTCT, I think, where we made the biggest gains uh, with QI and then to other areas. And, and so I will draw a little bit of my experiences from that work as well, uh, speaking about TB. And so what I'm not expecting are technical questions on the clinical management of TB here. Um, <laughs> okay? but more on the improvement science and how it can be done or, or what will be done. So um, my presentation is very much more from the programmatic side of things, you know, in terms of how, how do we uh, improve the quality of care using quality improvement. So it may not be so much about uh, clinical, but we're moving towards scaling up and implementing what we know. So it's more about how do we actually implement what we know about TB. Um, I have an outline about uh, that talks about quality improvement and as, as, as short background, and then uh, improvement in Uganda and other areas, uh, the gaps in TB care, and then a little bit, of course, about the USAID TB project and what we are trying to do with TB in this country. Uh, some early results from our work and really how these results were achieved using QI. Um, now, the other part of me is that I am a trainer and so I am always, I, I, I like to have participation from the audience so there might be a little bit of an exercise in between my talk to break things up a bit because I cannot talk for 40 minutes to an hour that long. So you'll bear with me if it's not what is normally done. So um, when we talk about quality improvement, the first thing that we want to ask ourselves is really why we should care about quality improvement, especially for healthcare. And the thing is, as clinicians, we, I'm assuming we're clinicians, we're researchers, we're future clinicians, we often require our patients to make changes to their lifestyle, to have better results, to make their health better. We ask them to stop smoking, to do exercise, to eat healthier, to come to the clinic often. Really, we're asking them to have make tweaks in their habits, to change their attitude, and then to standardize their practice, make it a lifestyle. And so I think that if our patients can do that, then they deserve the same from us in the healthcare business. As healthcare practitioners or people who are going to do that, we also need to tweak and have the attitude to improve our work, okay? And so that's just summarizing that. And so how do we then use QI to make healthcare better, I guess is the question that I want to answer or to speak to this afternoon. So, um, a little background about why QI is an issue, and I think uh, someone has hinted to that. We know that this was a study that was carried out, a book actually published by the Institute of Medicine, and they were looking at the issues around quality healthcare. And this is a quote from this book that says, between the healthcare we have and the care we can have, lies not only a gap, but a chasm, and the problems come from poor systems, not bad people. We tend to, when we do our work, I, I, we tend to want to blame people first before we talk about the patients. The, 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 yeah, we want to blame the people, the patients, the health workers, they haven't done this, haven't done that without considering the system, and yet we know that 80% of the problems that are caused in this are, are system-related. 85% are actually system-related and are only 15% to do with the people in the system. So, and this is really a phenomenon generally across every area. We have the best available knowledge, but it's not being implemented in the everyday work to benefit patients and, 
Uh, and so QI tries to do that, to make sure that we're using what we know to provide the best care. Uh, I'm hoping that most of us know a bit about QI. Oh, it's, it's quite simple. It, it, it's, it's a simple thing. It's, it's the process of bridging the gap between current practices, what we're doing right now, and the desired set or set standards. So for TB, we want to find more cases, for example. We, we know that we're not reaching the cases we're supposed to reach. And so what we do to change the system, the changes that we put in place uh, relate to quality improvement. If we want to make sure that we're putting, we, we're, we're achieving the 90% of patients uh, having a good, achieving treatment success rate or above 80% uh, as, as the government sets it, then whatever we're doing to make sure that our patients have a uh, treatment success rate above that will be quality improvement, okay? And of course there are dimensions of quality. So these are, when we talk about quality healthcare, we're looking at patient safety, effectiveness of our interventions or the healthcare that we provide, uh, that it is patient-centered, it is timely, it's efficient, and it's equitable, that everybody will receive the same service no matter who they are or where they come from. The same quality of service will be provided. Okay? So the primary goal of QI, or improvement science, really is to determine which improvement strategies work as we strive to assure effective and safe patient care. So in short, often, knowing the right thing to do and actually doing it are two different things. And I think that um, we shall see that as we have uh, more discussions around this. Having said that, we do also know that quality improvement has been used in other areas. He's alluded to TB specifically in Senegal. We know that South Africa runs a very big TB, HIV, QI program, and this was only recently that they put the QI into that uh, program and are seeing improvement. Closer to home, again, this is work that we did with some of my colleagues in this room where we were working on the PMTCT outcomes, reducing the number of children uh, discharged from the PMTCT program uh, as HIV positive. And this just shows that with time, the proportion of children went from 23% to under 3% over a period of two years in terms of babies who are being discharged. And this was a purely quality improvement program. Everything was in place. The information was available, the drugs were available, but simply working on the processes to make sure that babies came back to care, they received the appropriate care, led to this. Um, we also have demonstrated the use of QI and what results uh, in northern Uganda, where we used it to reduce postpartum hemorrhage. Again, this is site level information. It's from 20 health facilities in northern Uganda that were implementing the Saving Mothers Giving Lives Initiative, which was under the URC Assist Project. And you can see again that as they, um, as the, as they used uh, Amstel, the blue line is Amstel, the, there was a reduction in postpartum hemorrhage. Okay. Still again using the, the QI. Elsewhere, this is just a simple example, this is normally how we would show QI work. Um, in Tanzania, again, quality improvement was used to get more women started on ARVs. Uh, and in, in terms of my examples are mainly from the HIV field because that is where we have done a lot of work. And I think HIV has uh, embraced this concept a lot more. Uh, and so, when it comes to TB, however, there is a puzzle or, or a situation, and this is from an outsider observing, because this is the first time I'm actually working on TB. Um, the, the science of improvement has actually probably bypassed TB or TB care has struggled or is struggling to adopt uh, the science of improvement. So somehow we want to try and bring those two arrows to face the same way and to merge so that we're using TB, I mean we're using quality improvement to improve TB care. Uh, the main reason of parking why we have this is because the policies and plans in TB care and control are made at the global level, mainly. WHO issues policies, the country adopts them, you know, at the national level. And then they're implemented in a top-down manner without rapid cycles of testing and improvement at the field level. So NTLP comes up, they have the information, this is what has to be done, this is what they say, all of you must screen. 
we must all screen, we must all do contact tracing, let's all do this, let's all have this. It's heavily prescriptive and doesn't allow for a bottoms up approach in terms of that. The other thing I have noticed is that the people that manage TB are in silos. There, there is the TB leprosy focal person and the TB, you know, and this is often what happens in health facilities that if a case comes in and they are suspected, what they'll do is to say, wait for so and so to come. So those are all missed opportunities around that. Um, again, closer to home, we know, I think, that uh, we are one, Uganda is one of the 30 high burden TB countries. We have a prevalence that is one and a half times higher than previously estimated. I think the prevalence survey showed that we were actually missing more cases and we should be doing that. Uh, we missed in, in, um, in, in 2017, we only found 56% of the cases that we expected to find. So we missed about 33,000 TB patients. We also know that HIV prevalence amongst um, Adults is 6.4% and the TB HIV co-infection among TB patients is 42%. And so we need to have uh, discussions around that in terms of finding cases, putting them on treatment, but also what do we do with the issue with co-infection. Uh, just to demonstrate or to, or to labor the, 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 the points before, in the last few years, actually, when it comes to TB case detection, we have stagnated as a country. We, we, this graph is, just shows, the, the blue line shows the total TB cases that we found, and I think between 2000 and 2016, we are more or less operating at the same. And actually, not even the introduction of the gene expert in 2012 led to the increased cases that we were expecting, right? We, 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 we still haven't got to where we need to be. When it comes to treatment success rate, this is just last quarter's data, April to June, we can see that even when we find the cases, we are not keeping them in care. We are not, I, I, either, you know, there are issues around treatment success rate. Our national target is to have 82% treatment success rate, and a good number of our districts are actually registering below 70% in there. Now, I know, of course, it has to do with, sometimes it has to do with the denominators used and the number of patients, but when you actually look at actual numbers, it's true that the reds, districts have the bigger numbers. The, area, the whole of the Karamoja region has big numbers being started on treatment, but they cannot, yeah, they're not following them up. And when it comes to the quality of TB care, now that was just the numbers in terms of outcomes, but when it comes to actual quality of services and quality of TB care provided, we know that there are large gaps in the cascade of, of care across the different types of TB, whether it's MDR TB or, or uh, the GSTB, the, the same thing, we have gaps in the cascade. We have inadequate TB and care and treatment services. Yes, in the last few years we have expanded, we have rolled out gene experts, machines and everything, but we still have inadequate care and treatment, both in terms of the practice, but also the human resource to provide that. Um, we know that private or informal sectors are usually the first point of contact for TB patients, and yet that area is quite weak and often neglected. Uh, there's poor linkage and referral between services, be it to, for treatment, be it for diagnostics. We have poor uh, referral. And of course, to the patients, we have high costs and long waiting times for care and treatment. And so we definitely need a quality revo revolution in TB, I think. Okay? So this is where um, I start to talk about the Defeat TB project, I think, and what we have done, or what, what is happening in there. So for those of us who might not know about the Defeat TB project, it's a USAID funded program, project, uh, that's running for five years. It started last year, we are in our, we've just started our second year. And the goal of the project is to reduce the TB burden substantially in Uganda by 2023. The purpose of the project is um, to, to have TB case detection and treatment success increased in Uganda to 90% of all cases. Our specific objectives are really to increase screening and detection in all, for all forms of TB, to initiate and complete treatment for all TB patients, to ensure a strong community system to support the continuum of TB prevention, screening, diagnosis, care, and treatment, and to enhance leadership and technical capacity of the TB program at national and sub-national levels. Um, this is, briefly, this is how we work, this is how the program works. We're at national level supporting the NTLP and the regional uh, level, 
We also work in the national and uh, regional referral hospitals. So Mulago is one of those hospitals and all the other regional referrals. And we provide uh, technical support as well as quality equipment support in these facilities. We also work in districts, general hospitals and health centers as well as the community. We also are working to leverage the resources with the TB implementing partners. That means the different regional mechanisms that are provided with funding to, to, to give uh, support to these districts. We work with them to leverage the, the resources that they have and get them to implement quality improvement in additional sites. And um, I think that is it about the program. So we have set out, when we set out to do this work, we knew that we were going to use quality improvement as the approach. Yes, there are other things, a lot of health system strengthening has to happen, but when it comes to actual service delivery, we're using a quality improvement approach. And we started off with improving TV case notification. This is, I forgot to mention that much as we're national, we also are responsible for Kampala, Wakiso, and Mukono when it comes to TB. We are directly implementing, uh, so to speak, in programming language in those three districts. And these three districts act as our laboratory um, in addition to the 30 sites that we, the 34 sites that we are jointly working in with the implementing partners across the 10 regions. So this is, uh, then are showing the case notification trends from Kampala, Mokono, Wakiso. And you can see that between uh, October of 2017 and June of 2018, all the three districts have actually had a substantial increase in the number of cases, additional cases uh, found. And actually in June, between April and June, we had 300 additional TB cases. We found 300 additional TB cases. At national level, we are working with 34 additional health facilities in the different regions, and this is a similar pattern that we have managed to find more cases. This is monthly data we picked up from the site, and it's disaggregated by, I mean, the, the, the bar chart shows the, the types of TB. So you have the PBC, PCD, and the extra pulmonary. And the green is the total cases. In, in, in um, I don't know if it's statistics or improvement, we have what we call a median. And when we present our data on run charts, and we have something about the media, and there are rules to interpret this. And actually what this shows is that there is an upward trend in the number of cases found. I wanted to point this out because this is our baseline period before we intervened, or before we started working with these sites. And this was after when we started in February of 2018. Um, this, this is what is happening. We have an increased number of cases. Again, uh, we have worked with teams to increase TB screening activities in the three focus districts, and I think you can see we started off with um, around between 30 and 40 percent of patients coming to the facility being screened, and by June 2018, we have 86 percent in Kono. Uh, 70. This is aggregated data, by the way, not not one site or two sites. This is across the sites that we support, and um, 76 percent in Wakiso and 70 percent in the sites in Kampala. Uh, just to sum it up, in the last quarter, this is, these are the additional cases found from each of the different areas. So from the three focus districts between quarter two, we found 388 additional cases. In quarter three, we found 301 additional cases. These cases are different from, they're different, you know, 388 and 301 are totally different cases in the individuals. Within the national collaborative, we've got a three, three hundred and ninety-seven additional cases, and for MDR, at the time of reporting, we had twenty additional cases for MDR. From seven, this is from the seven sites where we provide direct technical support. So, how have we achieved this, or how are we actually achieving this? Um, well, we are using this particular model, which is a framework for. In improvement, so to speak, and uh, I think that if we go away having understood this, I, that's that's the most important. That previously, what has been done is that we've issued standards, protocols, guidelines. New information is translated into guidelines, and then handed down. That's what we, that's, that's what was traditional quality improvement. We have new information that the ministry issues guidelines. We have different standards on what to do, how to screen, how to presume, and that kind of thing. 
and then hand it down to the health workers to use. So we call them, we train them, and leave them to it. Right? Occasionally, we go for mentorship once in a while. The difference here is that is now what we call the quantity of care. Continuous quality improvement actually seeks to work on the process of care. Work with teams to unpack those standards. What does it mean when you say screen all patients? What is it that I have to do? What does screening involve? Okay. What do we need to do differently? Because we are screening, but what do we need to do differently to get to where we want to be? Or even if we're not screening, how do we get, you know, how, how, how do we get started? Okay. And healthcare, um, I'll, I have a, an example that I will demonstrate towards the end. And teams are often struggling with that. So yes, we train them. We say we've trained and we're happy that we have trained. But when it actually comes to the results at the end of the day, when we're looking for the results and we're explaining about how we haven't found the cases and we've lost patients, the training doesn't actually seem to speak to that as well. So our QI focuses a lot more on the process of care, on the nitty gritty as people call it. People, people tend to say, you QI people, you focus on the nitty gritty, but that's what gets things done, okay? So basically we work with one improvement concept, that every system is perfectly designed to achieve exactly the results it achieves. If you set up a system that's only going to get you 30% of patients, that is what you will get. Okay? If you start your system with oranges, don't expect to get mango juice at the end of the day. Okay? So, if you want different outcomes, or if you want different outcomes or results, we have to change the system. By system, I, I mean how care is provided, not system politically or basic system. <laughs> the, the system in terms of how we provide care. And systems at site level. Change can happen at national level, but the work is actually happening at site level, and so the systems at site level need to change. Okay. So the improvement approach that we use engages teams of providers and other staff. Okay. So everybody who has a role to play in whatever process we are working on is part of that team. The focus is on client needs, what do patients need. What does the lab person also need? Because they're, they're internal and external clients, not just patients coming to the facility. So how can we make it better so that we are focusing on needs? It analyzes systems and processes. So there's a lot of unpacking, understanding what is happening so that we can get to the root cause of the problem and address that root cause, rather than assuming that we know what the problem is in sites. It empowers teams to make changes to improve outcomes. So there's a lot of creativity and innovation uh, encouraged at, in those sites. And often, we want the site to arrive at their solution on their own because it means that it is more sustainable. If a site team developed its own change idea and implemented it, it is more sustainable than saying my colleagues or myself going out and telling them to do it this way. It's guided by data to measure results and is also hinged on peer-to-peer -peer learning. Okay. Uh, this is what we have as a model for improvement, really. We have four, three fundamental questions. What are we trying to accomplish? Okay. How will we know that a change is an improvement? And what changes can we make that will result in improvement? And once we have those changes, we take them through the Plan, Do, Study Act. These were the cycles I, refer, I referred to earlier, the rapid cycles of improvement, where sites test things on a small scale before they actually implement them. Uh, maybe to demonstrate what I mean, this is what we mean by rapid changes or, or rapid change cycles or PDSs. We have the overall aim. I hope that this can be seen. It can't have to be it. Well, we're trying, what are we trying to accomplish? That's the question. We want to increase TB cases detected using the X-ray, for example. Okay? So the measures, how we know that a change is an improvement with the percentage of TB cases diagnosed by X-ray. And the changes, what changes can we make that will result in an improvement? perhaps do an x-ray for all children who have had pneumonia and men admitted on the ward. That is my change idea, not for all children who are coming, but those who have had pneumonia, for example, and all men who are admitted on the ward. Of course, there has to be some prediction and reasoning behind that change. We know that, for example, there are certain groups of men who are missing and falling out of care. We know that sometimes children keep coming to the facility often, and are given antibiotics, so they've had pneumonia, and the clinician has stopped at that. They will not consider. So this is the change. 
So we have a small test first. We do an x-ray for the children admitted on the board. Mm -hmm. Stop, we plan to do it, we do it, we study, and we act. If this change yielded, maybe we found two more children. We found two children, or three. We'll say, let's increase the scale of test. Let's test under different conditions. Perhaps let's also include all males admitted on the board as well. And so we implement it and standardize it and say, from now on, in this health facility, the practice is that x-rays for all males and children, all males who are admitted on the ward, as well as children who have had pneumonia for a long time or who have been diagnosed with pneumonia, will get an x-ray. Because from the start, we started to see results. Sometimes this doesn't work out. That's why you have the act part where you can either adapt, adopt, or abandon that change idea. Okay? So, um, I hope we're ready for a little exercise. A very short exercise. I, I just want to demonstrate what I've been uh, speaking about. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you for change ideas. Okay, so you need a, a, a piece of paper or anywhere you can write. This should take us five, min five minutes. Okay, so the first step, pick a number from three to nine. Men, quietly, don't tell anyone else about your number. Hmm? You've done, you've done? Yeah. yeah. Pick a number from three to nine. Multiply the number that you have by nine. You can use calculators. Okay? So if you had four, multiply that four by nine. Then add 12 to the number from step two. So if you had the number you multiplied, add 12 to that number. What you got. Okay? So by now you should have a two-digit number. So it should be either 11, 12, 13, as long as there are two. If you have nine, there's a problem, okay? So if you have your two-digit number, add your two digits together. So in this step, you should have either 26 or 52. So add your 52, add five and two to give you seven, for example, okay? Are we together? Okay. So, divide the number from this step by three to give you a one-digit number. Divide this number here to give you a one-digit number. Okay? Now you're going to convert your number into a letter. So that if you have one as your number, then it is A. If you have two as the number, it's B. All the way to the alphabet. I'm hoping that no one has 26 <coughs> for Z. <laughs> yeah. So write down the name of a country that begins with your letter. So if your, your letter is now A, write down the name of that a country that begins with A. Oh. Number one. You want to start at number one? Here. Or if, so from here, you should have a one-digit number. So if, it's, if your number is four, it means it is letter T. If it is five, it is E. If it's six, it's F. Okay? So you have, all of us have a country now? Okay? So you go to the next letter. So if your number was four and it was D, your next letter is going to be E. Or if it was A, your next letter is going to be B. Okay? as it is, and write down the name of an animal, not a bird, we're scientists, right, biology, no bird, no insects, no fish, but an, an, I guess I'm looking for a mammal, an animal that begins with the letter from step eight, so your second letter. <laughs> step eight, where are you? You're at step eight. So if you had your country, so if your first letter was F, for example, you have now a country starting with F. So what comes after F? G. So the animal should start with the letter G. In English or in Oh, yeah. I know that. In English, please. I don't expect him. In English. And it should be a letter. Okay. And the last step is write down 
สำคัญเราโยอันนี้เย่ write down นะคะเราโยอันโอเค who's done we have from someone else yes yes what do you have I have fearless ego and black ego and black okay I needed to turn but you have You have a black ego from DRC. Yes. Okay, a black ego from DRC is Richard. A black ego from DRC. Anyone else? Exactly. He didn't follow the instructions here. He said not a bad. Ego is a bad. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying. That he did not follow. When it came to step nine, he didn't follow the instructions. Yes. Yes. I have a grey elephant from Denmark. You have a grey elephant from Denmark? How many people have a grey elephant from Denmark? A grey elephant from Denmark. How many people have a grey elephant from DRC? How many people have a different country from Denmark? Ibu, what can you do? Djibouti. Okay? Djibouti. What do you notice about these countries? What, what is the first thing that's apart from D? The letter D, right? The letter D. How many people have elephants? Interesting. Why, were you cheating or you copying from each other? And the brain is going to be So? How many people have a sedan or ask about it? You had Ila. You had Ila. Okay. But it starts with that E. That's right. What I'm trying to what what do you think I'm trying to demonstrate with this game? What do you think that this game was meant to, 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 to demonstrate? Or what do you think I'm trying to demonstrate? The system. The system. What about the system? So we arrive at the same outcomes following the process. Okay, we arrive at the same outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Demonstrate the same what I told you about that every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it's given. Mm -hmm. So this particular game was designed to actually get you to end up with a deep country, <laughs> an e animal, and a green, I mean a grey elephant. Yes. Now, of course, there is variation in the system. That's why you have Iland, you have Djibouti, but all the years I've played this game, Grey Elephant in Denmark. <laughs> and it's not because it's a game, it's because of how we are tuned that our system actually will give us this. So if we wanted to get the ego or whatever, we would have removed this step and said, bring me any. If we wanted to get a different outcome, we would have started off with a different what? set of instructions. Okay? And so that's the same thing with our work. That if we want to have different outcomes, we have to change what goes in, for example, and how we get there. These are all processes. This need is actually a system, for example. And all of these are steps in that system. They are processes. So if we wanted to change this output, we needed to what? To change any of these steps. Either remove a step, add a step, change instructions. Okay? And that is what we have to think about when we are doing healthcare work, that we are operating in a system. If we want to have things different, we must change the system. Okay? So, now back to the talk. The fit has, we have a QI framework in the course of our work. And we are, it's in phases. We have the first phase that is the startup for quality improvement work where we define aims and improvement uh, objectives, we select appropriate sites for improvement, perform a baseline assessment because we want to know what the current practices are, and form quality improvement teams. Again, breaking that mold that TB is for the, the, the focal person. We want to involve everybody who provides care along the, the, the pathway. And then we have a period of action where we have coaching visits to sites. We go out to coach. There are people who are skilled in quality improvement but are also knowledgeable about TV. So sometimes they are paired that you have a QI coach 
and a TV uh, person, a practitioner, a, a person who knows about the guidelines and the content. So they go out, they sit with these teams, and in between those coaching visits, we have peer-to-peer -peer learning because we know that peer-to-peer -peer learning has led to improvement across boards. Usually, a health worker is more likely to make changes if a peer has demonstrated improvement using that particular change. Okay? And the third phase, which is where we are now, is consolidating learning and standardizing. So what do we learn from these sites here, these few sites, about improving screening, about X-ray use, about the use of the gene expert, about uh, treatment follow-up and success rates? What are we learning? And this will be packaged into you know, package, to change packages, which change packages hopefully will influence guidelines and the protocols that the ministry provides for TB. Uh, a good example that I have of this having worked really with the PMTCT work. I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but PMTCT used to be that the mother and the baby were seen differently. The mother has her own air today, the baby is coming to the exposed infant, uh, the EID corner on a different day. So when we started out this work, the, the, the work on improving HIV free survival, we did pretty much the same thing here. But during the coaching visits, one of the major changes that came out, because we realized one of the problems was retention of mother-baby pairs. That one, you couldn't tell which mother had a baby in care, you didn't know how often they came or even if they were receiving ARPs. One of the changes that the sites came up with was to either give the same appointment day and to merge the clinic so that mothers and babies are seen together in one place by the same person. Now that previously wasn't the guideline. And indeed, when we went out with the ministry to those sites, a lot of resistance, there was a lot of resistance to that particular change, especially the change of putting medical records together, the mother's card and the baby's card. And they pulled it apart. But because of demonstrated improvement in those sites, the policy actually changed to have mother-baby care points and to put cards together. And that is how QI can actually influence policy and guidelines. That it's a bottom-up approach. Sites go out, try things, learn about how to do things better, and actually produce the information and the evidence for that. Of course, we want to have a critical mass of sites implementing the changes that, uh, that, that have been demonstrated in the three districts. And so our overall aim as for improvement really should be scaling up, spreading, and institutionalizing the changes that we put in place. Because if we want to contribute towards our strategy to end TB, we need to have a critical mass of people working in the same things. Yeah? And so the last phase is really to scale up what we need to do. And this is what we're aiming for, I suppose. I have a small example about a particular QI project. I don't know if I should go through that or move to the next bit, in terms of what actually happens at, at sites. Because yes, we want to do TB case finding, but at site level, different things happen. Their processes are different. Well, they have worked out that their problem is actually uh, something else. So this is just a real example from one of the sites that we support. Um, and the project that they implemented was increasing the number of negative smears referred for gene expert. This was a site that previously did not have a gene expert. They were using microscopy for um, diagnosis. So the problem that they identified was that smear samples that were sent for gene expert testing was low, the number, and um, the underlying factors, now this is a gap analysis, is that they had gaps in identifying the samples that were eligible for referral, and the patients with negative smears got lost before the results returned, or uh, they got lost before the results were returned, or results were returned after the patients left the facility. So those who had negative smears couldn't provide another sample. And then the samples that were sent for the expert were not recorded. So those were some of the gaps. Of course, they can't address all of these gaps at once, so they chose one. So the changes that they implemented were to generate a list of patients with a negative smear to be referred for gene expert testing. And then take two samples from every patient, one for the smear and the other for the gene expert. So that if your results come back and they are negative, I still have a sample that I can send for gene expert without asking you to either come back or to wait at the facility until the results have come back. 
So what we saw was that by the end of May, this data was measured weekly, and the referral, the proportion of negative smears that were referred for the next month improved from 20% in April to about 78.45% by the end of May. This site, luckily, now has a gene expert and doesn't have to refer, but this is an example of how improvement is very much a site-based thing, that the team knows their problems and that they will be skilled to actually solve their problems that way. This is just the, these are just the results, and of course, the points at which the change is not tested. Okay, so in summary, well, not in summary, but if we want to improve sub service delivery for TB, we need to develop and standardize a package of care for TB. What are the key elements that are necessary for TB care? We will tend to have manuals this big that we send out to the sites, we send out colorful protocols and things like that. But what are the basic elements? As a health worker, a frontline health worker, what do I need to actually provide TB care? What is the best minimum, so to speak? Okay. And then we need to work with facility teams to reorganize the processes of care and integrate and improve services. We also need to identify and engage support structures to provide services because QI alone isn't going to solve some of those issues. Some issues are around supply chain, around community engagement, around leadership and governance. So we need to look at beyond that and also set up data systems to monitor service delivery and outcomes for this work. Um, some of the changes or the examples that we have, and this is from a few sites learning, is that if we want to improve TB care, we have to improve clinic efficiency and have changes around clinic organization, linkages, and referral of samples. We need a system that builds skills and proficiency. We cannot, we cannot train people all the time, but we can have a system that allows for health workers to pick up skills on the job, for example. One of the things that we're using, especially for x-ray, for example, one of the key changes we're using is the use of the WhatsApp group. That the WhatsApp group has teams and clinicians who are skilled in interpreting x-rays, and some teams will often ask questions and, and build that. So they have the, the advantage of peer support as well as experts in the group to provide and support with the interpretation. Um, we have to improve data quality and concordance. This is very much a, a big issue, especially with TV. The registers don't speak to each other. And that's why sometimes even just by cleaning data, improving recording, improving, improving concordance, a number of cases goes up. So that's something that we need to work on. And of course, improve the referral of samples. Uh, in the course of our learning, this is a very heavy slide, but this is, for example, the learning that we have. These are what we call the change packages. That if we want to improve the gene expert diagnostic cascade, these are some of the changes that sites have put in place. And each change addresses a specific problem. So for example, if we have long number of samples being referred for gene expert testing, sites found that if they assign staff at all entry points to screen and send cases to the lab for evaluation, they have more cases. They also found that if they put sputum marks at entry points, rather than asking the patient to go to the lab and produce a sample or go to work, they will find, and then getting one person to take those samples at intervals during the day to the lab and following up, they had more cases from that people were able to get more samples done. Okay. Uh, when it came to x-ray use, for example, uh, setting up a clinical team to reevaluate or to reassess negative gene experts and do an x-ray, directly escorting or prioritizing x-rays for, for, for patients or for suspects. Those are some of the changes again. So we are systematically learning and harvesting these changes and hoping that we will scale these changes up. Okay. So what we are learning from using the quality improvement approach is that TB care needs to be integrated across the spectrum of care. Okay. And QI approach allows for this integration. QI teams need to be regularly and consistently engaged to look at their data, test changes, and share their learning. And that what we know is that health workers appear to gain more motivation from getting more TB cases through the QI process, and they are willing to explore and try new ideas to find the missing cases. Um, and of course, improvement at one group of facilities needs to be actively disseminated to all other facilities. So at our level, I would say, as 
either researchers, future policy makers, or actually future implementers or programmers, because this is what needs to be done. We need to build pure into training and research. Not, it's a skill that you pick up, and, and the, the way you build on that skill is by constantly using it. So we need to build that into tra training and research. And it needs to become an integral part of the designing TV programs with a systematic way to address the gaps that have been identified. And of course, there's a need for the TV field to adopt and implement the science of improvement because the old fashioned way of doing things will not work if you at MTB. Okay, I don't know how much time I have to drive that. It will be fast. I have five minutes from my. Okay, I just want to demonstrate an example for something else from another field, which was NAX. I, I maybe this will help us to open up. This NACS is Nutrition Assessment Counseling and Support, and it is a, a platform that is used for people living with HIV that will integrate nutrition assessment counseling and supporting their care. And this was a this is this is an example from work that we did with sites in uh, Uganda, and this is from one site. So one of the things about NACS is that patients have to be assessed using mid upper circumference or any other parameter. In this case, we were using the work. and so. We had a baseline. We went out to this site. This particular site is a hospital. And for the baseline period, there was no assessment being done for these patients. Okay? So, because no one did anything at that time. Okay? Why would you think that NAX was not implemented? Why weren't patients being assessed? It's, it's a right line for it. They know that it has to be done. It's, 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 it's even on the ART card, for example. Yeah, so why wouldn't assessment happen? Okay? Uh, most likely because the staff were too busy and they hadn't prioritized. Mm -hmm. this, this wasn't a priority for them, apparently. So then, in week seven, as we do, we have a nutrition training a five-day comprehensive, actually six-day comprehensive training with demonstrations off-site, you know, everything, six days. Again, week nine, we delivered commodities. That was a time when we were rolling out the ready-to-use therapeutic food to treat malnutrition. Those, and then the mock tapes were delivered, commodities were delivered. Another two weeks, there was nothing happening, right? So we went out on a coaching visit. And one of the things that they told everyone to do was tell everyone to do work. They told everybody to do work and walked away. You know, we should all screen. Let's all screen. You have to screen for patients. You have to do this. Let's all screen for TB. And then we walk away. OK? So why do you think that NACS was not implemented, even though supplies were available and the staff were trained at the time? In relation to what I've been talking about, why do you think that no, no screenings happened? They have what they need. They know what to do. Why did they do it? Five minutes. Bruce, you look like you have an answer. Yes, I have an answer. Uh-huh. I will give the answer from the clinic. OK. Because in the clinic, we do routine things. When I sit on my table, patient comes, there are certain things I do, which are part of my behavior, which I've developed over time. I meet the patients in this standard way. There are certain things I do. And I developed those things through training. Um, and they became part of me. So what I think is, although those things were done, these people were not able to make sure that that thing is part of their finger. because. Deliver of healthcare is a habit, sort of. So, but of course, someone can argue that during the training they practiced. Mm -hmm. So, I really, maybe that part I'm not sure why they did the pick the skill from the training. Mm -hmm. Actually, they were skilled and they had the documents, but they just didn't, they didn't do it. Okay, maybe let's see what happens after that. Your answer is partly correct that the TSC becomes ingrained and that we don't change. Even if we have a new skill added, we will not use that skill often, or we don't use it soon. So, something happens in week 11. Mm -hmm. We are now screening 100%. Mm -hmm. 
what, what usually happens in, in, in these situations? What, what is happening? What do you think will happen? Either there's a person assigned in this particular site. They have the training, they have the commodities, they've told everybody to do work. Another week passes, nothing is done, and then suddenly in week 11, happens. And it's actually the USAID ambassador wanted to see how natural they would dash. We went out to the sites and were informed of an external visit. This is, this is what usually happens. We clean up the ward before the president comes. Instead of having a clean ward all the time, we don't have a system for cleaning the ward. We clean it up when he's coming. This is the same thing. Okay? So, and then what do you think happened after that 100%? Drops, right? Oh, no. So, for that one week, they, they did everything well. It dropped back. Okay? And then, again, why do you think that it dropped? Back to, yes, Rebecca. Yeah, so, so I was still saying, maybe still the issues of motivation are there, but also, of course, also still attitude, and also be one of them. Okay. And then the other thing is, at times, you realize that people at times don't do certain things. Maybe one could still say maybe they are they are not appreciated that it is important for them. Okay. So that maybe because they are not knowledgeable or maybe because it's attitude. Okay. So that kind of So there is the issue of attitude. Remember when I started my opening statement, what did I say? One of the things I said about people and systems, we have bad systems, not bad people. 85% of the problem is the system, 25% is, I mean 15% is people. So in this case, it dropped because they actually hadn't changed the system. They didn't put a system in place. Yes, they were trained, they knew it, but they didn't actually stop to think about how they were going to do it. Okay? And so at this point, through coaching visits, they decide to test a change. So they put an ask to assess work after registration. Okay? And so they looked at their client flow and decided that this is where they're going to do work. Okay? And so this is what happens. At least it takes them up to about 70% for these next few weeks. Okay? And then I'm going to stop asking that question and answer it myself and tell you that. So after that, they realize they're at 70% and yet they want to get to 100%. So they think about it again and, and, and ask themselves again, what is happening here? We put someone to do this work. What is happening? They realize that patients actually skip more to jump the queue. Okay? And sometimes patients were coming in the afternoon when the work staff is not, I mean the station is not staffed. The nurse has stopped working that. 11 and has gone away for lunch. So they come, they've come in, but they don't get assessed. So the team had to now do what? Test another change. So they involved expert patients in work at the registration desk to help the nurse, okay? And this is what happened. You can see that assessment went up to beyond 80%, hitting 90%. So now this, these are actually what they call the system changes, right? They've changed it, they've changed how care was organized. They've added a step into their process. Okay? So, when we talk about QI, in terms of where to begin, we want you to start with what you can do by tomorrow. So take action, focus on the things that matter. I know there's a lot that can be done, and that's why I kept on saying, what I, what I keep on saying is, isolate the key elements that are necessary for the health worker, for TB care, okay? Yes, we would like to do certain things. I, I don't know what is a nice to do thing for TB, I don't know. But you know, we would, we would like to, for example, we would like to have the BMI done, the work done, the, the, the weight taken, even sometimes cal calculate the bioimpedance, whatever it is. But I also know that I can quickly assess a patient from our nutrition using work. It's the simplest, I don't need to train so hard, you don't need to interpret that the codes are color, they're color. So red is malnourished and that kind of thing. So that is what matters that you're assessing, okay? And then focus on things that can be fixed, given the resources that you have and where success is likely. 
For example, at this point, we want everybody to do x-rays. Okay, we want to increase x-ray risk. But we don't have the machines. Machines are broken down. You haven't done, but you're expecting miraculously to have cases increase because of x-ray use. Okay? And then, work with people who will be supportive, for example, and learn from what others have done. Okay? And again, that is it. So I would like to end here. And of course, by acknowledging the teams that we work with and the districts, the coaches who support us, NTLP, uh, my colleagues from DEFEAT, and of course, the American people through USAID. And if you want more information about quality improvement generally and the work of the DEFEAT project, that is the link. But generally, URC uh, has a lot of uh, QI uh, experiences. It's one of our approaches in every project, whatever we, we are doing, whether it is health system strengthening or environmental or wash or whatever we use quality improvement as our, uh, as our method of work so there's a lot of examples and information around that from, from that um, thank you very much